Have you ever been taught how to diagram a sentence? Perhaps you have. And if so, maybe you'll remember seeing something like this. Maybe you've seen it, maybe not. Now it's debatable exactly which way is the correct way to diagram a sentence. In English, we front load the subject and verb. So it makes sense that we would go subject, verb, object, as we go down the tree. However, this isn't the only way of looking at it. If we take a little inspiration from programming languages, we might have the idea to front load the verb. Instead of modifiers going next to what they modify on the tree, we put them inside the nodes, higher up than the words they modify. We'll front load verbs and nouns come beneath. With this system, sentence diagrams look more like this. Now, this example isn't the best with how complex it is. Let's replace it with something easier. There we go. Interpreting this with verbs and modifiers before the nouns, this would read, I hate you because you suck. Looking at trees like this, you might notice that in general, we read them sort of left to right without too much regard to how high or low in the tree the word is. There is another way of reading this, starting with the root node, then go down the tree in the depth first manner. In this ordering, it would lead to hate I you because suck you. In some ways, this ordering is more natural, but it struggles to help you identify which nodes belong to which other nodes. Though this is technically true of any language, all human languages are limited by imprecise descriptions of simple syntax trees. There is, however, one fundamental limit to syntax trees. They're not complete. What do I mean by that? I mean, they're Turing complete. They don't have the power to describe a complete computation in the way that a Turing machine can. What do I mean by this? I mean that syntax trees are limited to being trees. In a syntax tree, each node can only have one parent. And they're always finite. And they just don't feel dramatic. Luckily, we have these things called Turing machines. In fact, you're using one to watch this video right now. Turing machines are one system we can use to turn a finite amount of information into an infinite amount of potential computational complexity. Turing machines can do recursion. Turing, who you might have heard of, cracked the Enigma code, was openly gay, and got arrested by the government that he served for being openly gay. I just woke up in a Shut steamy mood, yeah? Because I live in a Shut hole. Invented the Turing machine. Very creative name. And at about the same time, a guy called Church invented Lambda Calculus. Lambda Calculus was a way of doing computation with nothing but functions. Like, that's it. All you have is functions being called with other functions as inputs. It looks something like this in practice. This is a function that takes three inputs. It calls the first input using the second input, then calls the result using the third. We write BTF as a shorthand, but it can also be written as either of these ways, whichever you prefer. Now, Lambda Calculus, you might notice, is a language, and because it's a language, its expressiveness is limited to that of any ordinary language that has a syntax tree. However, if we actually try to do computation using the Lambda function, it actually can create a new type of tree for us. Since this tree doesn't need to follow the rules of an ordinary tree, we can actually call it a computational graph. Let's take a look at what the if function does for us when we apply it to three inputs, A, B, and C. Huh, well, that's a bit anticlimactic. We could phrase this as B, A, C if you take that as being a phrase, but that's basic. Where does the interesting stuff come into play? Well, let's take a look at a more interesting lambda expression. And for the sake of simplicity, we'll apply it to x, y, and z. Whoa, what just, what just happened there? Not only do y and z share the same leaf node, 
but here we're making that top x responsible for handling something that depends on x which is itself what can this possibly mean linguistically i'm not sure but i'm damn sure i want it anyway before we move on i'm gonna show you two more lambda expressions so we can get a feel for how wacky these can get this one is infinitely big the f's just keep going on forever down and down and down to the left the funny thing about this is if you try running it on your computer there are ways to get this computation to stop and give you a result if you carefully design f's and use lazy evaluation this function that creates infinite stacks when given a function as input is called the y combinator and it's the basis of most recursion in lambda calculus okay this next one is a little weird now this one just keeps calling itself with itself as the input and never stops recursing but unlike the y combinator this one doesn't really care about its other inputs it's obsessed with becoming itself if you've ever made an infinite loop while programming before you know what it's like now lambda calculus is cool and all but it's not entirely fit to become a language just yet it has the issue where you can create as many variables as you want, but traditionally, each variable is one letter, and my keyboard only has so many letters. Also, we want it to be possible for people to speak the language, and having an infinite number of phonemes does not sound like a good time. So, to fix those problems, we're writing the language using ski calculus instead. What is ski calculus? Well, it's a close relative of lambda calculus. It was discovered that all lambda expressions have a ski equivalent, and there are three basic building blocks in ski. Let's take a look at them. This one is an identity function. It gives you back whatever you give it. Kinda lame. This one is more like a memory function. When you give it its first input, x, it remembers that until you give it another input, y. Then it gives you x back. What y is doesn't really matter since it gets ignored. This one is a doozy. It's called the substitution function, but it's really just used to duplicate and spread around its third argument, x. Without this one, recursion wouldn't be possible. There are a couple transformation rules that I'm not going to get into that let you convert any lambda expression into a ski expression and vice versa. But simply put, here's a y combinator written in ski. And that funny, infinitely busy lambda expression I showed you earlier? The ski equivalent of it is... Wait, 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 wait. How is this a human language? Literally, all we have is a bunch of functions. Is what you're probably wondering. But here's where things get interesting. This language has a bunch of words in it, but none of them are spoken. All the nouns are implicit, so what the speakers do is use ski calculus to create a syntax tree, or rather a computational graph, for those implicit content words to reside in. You can think of it like this. Imagine your dictionary is five words long. Your sentence has to be a function which takes five inputs and creates a computational graph which acts like a semantic meaning graph demonstrating meaning in a similar way to the sentence diagrams we saw at the beginning of the video. In lambda calculus, we want a function to look like this. Well, the lambda expression would be the same if written like this, we're just using words because it's easier to keep track of, but the words themselves aren't in the function. This corresponds to the tree when we apply the dictionary to our function. But remember, we're not speaking lambda, we're speaking ski, so we have to rewrite this into ski calculus. Doing this, we get... That's, um, annoyingly large and complicated. But we'll just have to deal with that for now. What are you doing, man? What are you doing, man? What are you also might be wondering how names work. Let's just say the dictionary includes the entire alphabet. So you have to write a ski function which takes in at least 26 inputs and spells out your name using function application. Have fun! <laughs> Like the programming languages which inspired it, Ski uses a prefix-based grammar. Single argument prefix functions, aka parent nodes, modify their child phrases in some way, 
then take on their role in the greater phrase. These prefix nodes include four case markers. These are for the direct object, indirect object, result, and manner of a verb, as well as a logical inversion marker. There's also two non-single argument grammatical words. One is the copula, which has some kinda complicated behavior. The other is the pick function, which takes a relative clause and a number, n, and it essentially rips the nth input to that verb to be the word it describes. These seven functions are part of the basic grammar lexical set. I'll get the rest of the lexical set shortly, now we need to talk about pronouns. In Ski, other than the first and second person pronouns, I and you, you can only use a pronoun to refer to something in the same sentence. This is done by having the computation graph reuse an intermediate node in multiple places. Think of this graph here. This means the apple I bought was rotten, so I threw it out. Ski calculus allows us to reuse the entire phrase, so even if there were other nouns in the sentence, the word it wouldn't be ambiguous since it doesn't exist. Since you can duplicate entire phrases and mess with the graph structure, there's nothing stopping you from reusing embedded clauses like this. Also, since the dictionary only has one copy of each vocab word, anytime you use the same word twice, you're drawing from the same source, so to speak. It's kinda weird to think about. In Ski, there's also a couple formulations which don't really affect the semantic meaning of the sentence exactly, but have a more idiomatic purpose. If you have a double link like this, it's how you would talk about plurals. You can use the double link or the pluralizer. There's also the Y combinator. When applied to one input, it refers to the concept of that thing, like foxes in general, rather than some specific foxes. But some formulations with two inputs have other meanings based on repeated application. These grammar rules lead to some weird constructions. I may have forgotten to mention, but every word in Ski is a noun. The only exceptions are the words in the basic grammar lexical set and the words in the extended grammar lexical set. Nouns can be treated like verbs if, in the computational graph, they appear in a node that has children. Just keep that in mind. Has child nodes? Verb. No child nodes? Noun. Also, multiple children with the same case can be added to a clause, and it deals with it via logical disjunction. So, you can have and and or by doing that and combining it with some nested negations. Remember when I mentioned lexical sets? It's about time we get back to that. Now, making a function which reads the entire dictionary, then ignores most of it, is very unwieldy. So, what they do instead is break up the dictionary into several lexical sets. Then the input to their ski function, aka sentence, is just the list made up of those sets. The way they specify the lexical sets is as such. The speaker says a ski function which takes the function append filter and each lexical set as arguments. 2. Evaluate the function, then prepend the basic grammar lexical set. 3. The new list is the dictionary used as arguments in the second ski phrase, creating the actual sentence. A pent filter is somewhat complicated in order to make the first ski phrase simple. It takes the list of lexical sets to append and interprets it as a binary number of which to include and which to not. The number usually looks like this. All trailing ones are deleted, so this would become this. The specific sets are 2, 4, 6, 7, and 9. Those sets are appended together in the order specified by the argument list. Why is the append filter so complicated, you may ask? Well, it has to do with extending the dictionary. Most lexical sets in Ski are completely empty. This is because if the native speaker ever wants to coin new words, they have to gather them up and put them in an empty lexical set at once to not change the meaning of the sentences that already exist. This is the only way they found to guarantee the ability to add lexical sets and extend their language 
without making it incomprehensible. The result of using this system is that you have to give two ski expressions anytime you want to talk. The first is used to pick the lexical sets used in the temporary dictionary, and that dictionary is inputted into the second ski expression to actually give you the sentence. There's also this extremely irregular sentence that our researchers haven't quite figured out the reasoning for. Maybe you can deduce why it means what it does. That's all great and good. We have an arbitrarily long dictionary. Every sentence we have is actually two sentences spoken back to back, one to pick lexical sets from the dictionary and another to actually form the sentence. So how do we actually say these sentences? Well, that's where the phonology comes in. Each of these sounds is associated with two characters in the ski character set. The characters are left parentheses, right parentheses, S, K, and I. Four of them are associated with the end of a ski expression that only has one leftover character. The most common one is the sound of spitting. <laughs> now, looking at this phonology chart, we see a bunch of weird sounds. There's that weird American R sound, an aggressive lateral fricative, and a whole bunch of ejective affricates. According to Foible, <laughs> only exists in 12 or so languages, and only exists in three. This one doesn't sound like anything. It's just sticking your tongue out. And velopharyngeal sounds are usually considered a speech defect rather than phonemes. Now, let's look at the vowels. I'm gonna have my friend Double Negative say them for you now. U, U, E, E, E. Uh, yeah, those are all very similar to each other. Good luck on hearing the difference in fast speech. In practice, each one corresponds to a single ski symbol. You can kind of tell the difference between the start and end of one because mm. is the open parentheses and mm. is the closed parentheses. Wait, never mind. Those are almost exactly the same. Uh, maybe the people that speak this just have really good ears. Now, to end this all off, I'm going to translate to you one of the most elegant and prophetic phrases the English language has to offer. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. The bee, of course, flies anyway, because bees don't care. What humans think is impossible. <laughs> That is Vocaloid. I don't understand IPA, and Double Negative said there is no way he's reading all of that out loud in real time. If you want the full audio, I'll link it in the description. Anyway, here's the gloss for each sentence showing you the structure of the syntax tree in a lisp styled manner. It's a lot simpler to write it out this way, but unfortunately, ski calculus isn't very efficient. Mostly because the S function is very annoying to deal with and because of the whole implicit dictionary replacing normal vocabulary. And that's the video! Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. It was really fun to put this all together in something that I wasn't really familiar with at the start, but slowly grew to learn as Double Negative taught me the wacky world of ski calculus. If you liked my style of editing and like my voice for some friggin' reason, Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I mostly do holiday videos, but I'm looking to branch out pretty soon and hoping that this video is a good way to reach a new audience. Uh, and yeah, thanks and thank you. Let's hope, woo, bye.